Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for forty days and forty nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and placed him on a pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world in their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it's written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the triune God. Amen. Today's gospel tells of Jesus' temptation in the desert, his time of being tested for 40 days becomes a basis for our Lenten pilgrimage. Well, they are deep, heady theological scriptures this morning, our morning readings, especially that one from Romans. In the Genesis myth, Original created humans are tested by means of a talking serpent and they fall and fail and can come into sin and death. In Matthew, Jesus is tested by means of that old serpent, the devil, and succeeds. Jesus passes the test. As the writer to the Hebrews declares, we have one who in every respect has been tested with as we are, and yet without sin. In Romans, Paul takes up the story of original failure to prove how God provides a, a superior solution through Christ. He already passed every test for us by proxy. Paul explains that although the fall of the first couple into sin and death affects the many, meaning all of us. The grace of God through Christ reaching the many by far and away surpasses any and all outcomes of the fall. Following Jesus' example, we too expect to be tested, maybe, and in particular, through the season of Lent, to be examined by the Spirit as we practice examining ourselves. We expect to make such changes as to lean into some holy austerity or self-denial for the sake of loving others better, not just for the sake of ourselves, for 40 days. By the way, have you ever wondered about how the 40 days are reckoned? Will you count out 40 days from Ash Wednesday until you get to Holy Saturday, the day before Easter? Except Sundays aren't included. So I'm, I'm guessing that we get to take Sundays off from the season of Lent. <laughs> we should all get a day off once in a while. Anyway, the responses of Jesus at his trial by fire are recommended responses for us as we face tests in life. Live by God's word alone. Not put God to the test by showing distrust. Worship the Lord God and serve God only. To live by God's word. What does that mean? Well, here, at least for me, 
is its meaning in part. As people of God adhering to God's word, we are people of promise. We're people of gospel promise. Living by God's word alone means we're committed to the good news of forgiveness and grace and freedom and love and renewal to frame and form and shape and reshape our lives. I believe I've already told you in another message what I consider to be the most important priestly duty that I do on a Sunday morning. But just in case you've forgotten, I declare these words are words like them. Almighty God, who is rich in mercy, has given his only son to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority alone, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a time when Jesus was teaching about his upcoming arrest, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. And he said to the disciples, let this saying sink down into your ears. So too, whenever we hear the absolution, the, for, the declaration of our forgiveness, we need to give pause. We need to let those words sink down deep into the ears of our hearts. Sometimes God may stir up trouble to inspire and motivate some repentance and forgiveness. Pressures can reach a boiling over point into a faith crisis where our only recourse is to cry out to God for help. And sometimes we literally cry. Maybe you remember a time or two in your life. That certainly was my teenage experience of desperately needing to find God. I yelled out loud in my bedroom when I was all alone, God, if you really exist, reveal yourself to me. I've done many stupid things since then, and some really good things like marry Lynn and have a family and pursue my call. And all through everything, I have never not known a time where God has not been there for me. A lot of negatives in that sentence. <laughs> but you get my point. My number one daughter, Lael, I said I would refer to her. Her breaking point happened when she was about four years old. And I vividly remember her in the front year room. And she cried with tears for Jesus and for Daddy. And she said, please help me. I can't make it on my own. Again, since that day, she's never not had a personal faith. When we pause in a service to confess and receive absolution, we are remembering for ourselves the beginning of our faith and baptism all over again and calling to mind those personal experiences where repentance and forgiveness have been the most real. And in addition, as we go about our lives in and outside the church, we have a heightened self-awareness, or we ought to, of the gospel promises that go with us, that hover over and overshadow us wherever we go. For example, as I mentioned on Wednesday, sometimes we may worry about the state of our personal holiness. We may fret over not living up to a certain attitude or task. We wonder if we're capable enough or accomplished enough or worthy or acceptable or, as I said, just plain enough. And whereas we may at times strive for some higher degree of holiness or perfection, and whereas we might get anxious or fretful or self-debasing over apparently falling short, God's word of promise declares that not one parcel of holiness can be earned by us or behaviorally achieved or expressed by us, but that every measure of it comes down through his spoken gift of grace and goodness. 
were holy and acceptable and capable and worthy for no other reason than God simply says so. If God said it, it must be true. Jesus said in John 15, Now you're clean by the word that I've spoken to you. To the Corinthians, Paul writes that their qualities have only been conferred on them. You're washed, he said. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And all, Paul, in another letter, Paul also speaks of the church being made holy by cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. Presenting to the church, pre, uh, presenting the church to himself in splendor, without rock, uh, spot or wrinkle or any such thing. This mental awareness that holiness comes about by means of conferral and not effort removes all kinds of pressure to live up to some arbitrary standard of what you think that maybe God or the church or other people expect you to live up to. It sets us free to love our neighbor, not because we have to, but because we want to. Maybe it's all a matter of semantics, but I have a friend with whom I go round and round over this issue of personal holiness. What he calls sanctification, or what he calls progressive sanctification, I call arbitrary situational ethics. His idea of the Christian life involves growing to become a better person and be more and more biblically obedient. And my idea of it is to keep on receiving forgiveness and inner freedom to be able to better love and serve my neighbor. Maybe we're both talking about the same thing. Maybe not. But I know that inside I bristle at the one and I relaxingly welcome the other. Earlier I said that Jesus modeled three responses to live by God's word alone, to not put God to the test by showing distrust, to worship the Lord God and serve him only. Arguably, if you begin to live by God's word in the way that I've described, the plain results will be faith and trust in God alone and worshiping and serving him only. The call to receive and trust God's word leads me back to Psalm 32. I don't know uh, David's inspiration for the psalm. Some people connect this psalm with Psalm 51, which you remember is his song of repentance for sins of adultery and murder. G. Campbell Morgan says this is a psalm of penitence, but it's also a song of a ransomed soul. Rejoicing in the wonders of the grace of God. Sin is dealt with. Sorrow is comforted. Ignorance is instructed. And James Montgomery Boyce claims that this psalm was on St. Augustine's, was St. Augustine's favorite, and he had it carved on his wall next to his bed in his last days so that he could better meditate on it. It's worth a second listening. Happy are those whose for, uh, transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom God imputes no iniquity, in whose spirit is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, or else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but the steadfast love of God surrounds all who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, for shout for joy, all you upright in heart. 
Psalm 32 fortifies us to meet possible faith tests during the season of Lent. It promotes trust and being open, being teachable, receiving God's deliverance and protection, practicing penance, confession, absolution, and especially knowing happiness and joy of forgiveness and renewal. No matter what we may go through, or what God may have us endure, even if we drive God crazy, God will love us forever and like us for always, forever and ever, his child that we will be. Amen.